Well, it's good to see you all here today. What a blessing it is to begin out with good worship and a celebration of remembrance of what the Lord has done for us by coming and taking his body and sacrificing himself for us. Uh, what a blessing it is to remember the forgiveness of sins and the cost of uh, our redemption. This morning, we're going to go through a very familiar passage to many of you. We're going to talk about the Good Samaritan, which I'm sure all of you, any of you who have been to Sunday school probably have heard the story. And uh, I, I feel like uh, a quote from The Princess Bride. It does not mean what you think it means. It's an interesting thing how you can grow up in the church and you can read these things in the scripture and have an understanding and walk away with it and then look at it and pray through it and look at it with new eyes. And the scripture is always kind of unveiling new levels. And uh, my goodness, this is one of them. And we're, we're going to look at just a couple of easy passages and I hope I don't take too long. And if I feel I am, I'll cut it short and we'll, we'll roll over to next week. This week... Well, last week, rather, we looked at the great harvest where Jesus sent out the 70 and he sent them out and they did very much like what the 12 did and they took charge of demons and Jesus at the end of all this begins to rejoice and he says, Father, I'm, I'm just so overjoyed that you have revealed these things to babes and you have kept them from the wise. How God revealed himself to the lowest of the world. In fact, these 70 went to the, uh, the area of Samaria, which is full of Gentiles and, uh, or mixed Jews of that race. And so it, it, Jesus just rejoiced that God was doing this work, not with the people who were all full of themselves, but those who simply would listen to the gospel and believe. If you remember, we saw that the gospel uh, through that section that the disciples, they pair up, they go, they prepare for Jesus's return by harvesting souls. All of this is what we do as well. We pray for help. We travel light. We don't get too bogged down with the stuff of this world because we're on a mission. We bring peace and we're gracious to those who are guests. We're full of compassion and service to others. With gravity, we warn those who would disregard Jesus. It's important to warn people if they turn their heart cold towards Christ and understand the eternal consequence of denying their need. We take authority and value their salvation. We show humility as beggars who have received a free gift. And we know the honor of living in the times of unprecedented privilege and opportunity. Jesus said the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers into his field. So that would be us. And we always pray that, right? That the Lord would bring more. So this week, we're going to look at to serve or not to serve. It's interesting. There are three little chunks of scriptures. I hope we're able to get through all three of them today and get to verse 42. But the Good Samaritan in its context is a rather interesting scripture. And then today I've highlighted verse 27. And so he answered and he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Any of you who have been through Sunday school know that those are the two greatest things in the scriptures, right? It's love God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. And that kind of sums everything else up because if you love God, you're not going to do anything else that's going to violate the law. And if you love your neighbor, you're not going to do anything such as uh, to, you know, want to steal from them, want to murder them, be angry, be bitter, all of those things that we tend to accumulate in our heart if we're not careful about cleaning it out. And so here we have the picture of a Samaritan who serves this man on the side of the road. And then there's the story of Mary and Martha, which we'll get into. And it's interesting that these are right next to each other after this first conversation that Jesus has. And so let's look at it in context. The first section is, verse 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. 
do this and you will live. So if anybody asks you, how can I get to heaven? You know the answer. Right? Jesus says, do this and you will live. You got it. That's exactly right. At all times and in every situation, from birth to death, love the Lord with your heart, with your soul, with all of your strength and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, and you'll make it. Any of you uncomfortable yet? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus said, this is it. You, you got it, man. You, bingo. Ding, 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 ding. You win. How do you inherit eternal life? Eternal life doesn't come because your parents had it and you inherit it like you might inherit anything else or because you belong to a family or you belong to a race or you have a particular color or a socioeconomic background or even if you've been to church and been through Sunday school. It happens when you love God. That's an unconditional commitment to putting him first in every area of your life. And by the way, it's a present perfect tense, which means you do it and you always do it without fail. Everybody's feeling good about that, right? <laughs> it's sarcasm. Now, I know you're used to hearing sarcasm from me, but here it is. Because can anyone do this? That's the point. You see, we read this and say, yeah, okay. I got to remember to love God in my heart, my soul, is it my strength in my mind or my mind in my strength? Okay, I got to do that. And then I got to love my neighbor as myself. Well, let me see. I got a pork leg and cheese this morning. Did I get one for my neighbor? <laughs> I had a delicious cup of pumpkin coffee. I didn't get you one. I am not going to inherit eternal life based upon what Jesus says. So I have a problem. Look at what it says. A certain lawyer, by the way, he's a specialist in the law, the law of God, the first five books of Moses, okay? He knows the word of God. And he came to test Jesus. He came to tempt him. He came to trip him up. You see, the motive of which this man comes, it's very important to understand the motive when somebody comes up and asks. And Jesus says, well, what do you think it is? Well, it's the love of the Lord, your God with all of your heart. That, that means all of your emotions, your mind, your will. With everything that you have. How many of you do this? Flawlessly. Every moment of your life. Never had a selfish bone in your body, never worried about anything, never got mad at God. Why is this happening to me? You're unfair. Don't you care? No, you just say, God, whatever you want, it's fine. You want to take my life? Go ahead, take my life. Love God with everything you have. And then he wanting to justify himself, notice it tells us of his motive, the lawyer, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came there where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion so he went to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, set him on his own animal, brought him into an inn to take care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and he gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves. And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. 
as if the first chunk wasn't uncomfortable enough. <laughs> Jesus said, this is what you do to love your neighbor. This is what loving your neighbor looks like. And of course, we usually take the gospels and we take these parables and we squash them down to one little elemental truth, which is be kind. Be kind to people. Don't forget about the people suffering. And that's what you go away with if you go to Sunday school. Today, I hope you go with something a bit meatier. We'll pull it apart. A certain lawyer stood up and tested him. So this guy's got a motive. In fact, we see from the book of Mark, it's a succession of people who are coming up to Jesus with questions like, should we pay our taxes or not, Jesus? And of course he goes, you got some cash on you? Oh yeah, I got some right here. Well, why are you asking me? You got money in your pocket. Of course you're going to pay taxes. What are you, bonehead? That's if I was, see, that's why I would die much sooner than Jesus. <laughs> but he takes a denarii and he, he says, whose picture's on it? It's Caesar's. Well, then you give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. And he was doing pretty well. And they asked him question after question after question, seeking to trip him up. And Jesus answered all of their questions perfectly. And it's then when this guy comes up. And he's trying to trip Jesus up. So he asks him, how do, I how do I inherit eternal life? That is the question, isn't it? That's the question that every human being should ask. What is it that I need to do to get to heaven? How am I going to get there? Well, you can't get to heaven in a motor car. This motor car won't go that far. <laughs> well, you can't get to heaven in a motor car. I'm sorry, you probably heard all this. How do you get to heaven? That's the question on everybody's lips. And if you were to ask somebody, hey, how do you get to heaven? They'll say, oh. Or if you ask them more personally, are you going to heaven? Most people say, of course I'm going to heaven. Well, why not? Well, because I never murdered anybody. Oh, I see. So if you murder someone, you go to jail. But if you don't murder someone, you go to heaven. Well, not exactly. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not a really bad person. Oh, that's great. So you never do bad things. Well, this whole, I get to heaven by what I do thing. It's very curious. Everyone seems to think that there's a celestial scale and all of your good works go on this side and all of your bad works go on this side. And if the good works outweigh the bad works, you go to heaven. Ding, ding, ding. You win. You know, Jesus puts a nice white robe on you and you walk in and everything's good. Or... If you've done more evil than good, it's eh, and you go to the bad place and there's the big fiery slide down to hell. That's what most people believe. This man is going up with this conception. What must I do? Boy, it would be nice if it was just one thing, right? What do you need to do to get to heaven? Oh, if I could just get a golden ticket by opening a chocolate bar, boy, that'd be awesome. If there's only one thing I could do, but that's not the way it works. This guy came up with a bad motive. He's trying to trip Jesus up and he asks him the universal question, how do I get to heaven? How do I inherit eternal life? Which is a question that every one of us has asked at some point in time. How many of you got the answer? It's good. And Jesus gives him the answer. Actually, he gives Jesus the answer. Well, it's interesting that he has this answer for Jesus and it's interesting that everyone has this question. It's the universal question, isn't it? In fact, in Mark 10, 17 to 22, someone else came to Jesus and said that. Now, as he was going out on the road, he came running and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So here's another guy asking the same question of Jesus. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There's no one good, but one, that is God. I imagine there was a pause. And then he says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. So he, he raffles off some pretty big things that if you didn't do, you're okay, right? So you think, hey, I'm going to heaven if I don't do these things, right? And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. I'm a good person. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Do you get Jesus' motive? He loved him. And he said to him, 
one thing you lack. Ooh, this is it. This is it. The one thing. Ready? We're all on the edge of our seats. <laughs> Go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So Jesus told this guy he had to get rid of everything he owned. Same question, two different answers. Why is that? Because this guy had a different problem from our lawyer. He was holding on to something and worshiping it in place of God. He wasn't loving God with his heart, his soul, his strength, and his mind, and loving his neighbors himself. He was loving himself and loving no one else, and he loved his stuff more than he loved God. And Jesus put his finger on his idolatry. He does the same thing to the lawyer who knows the law. He singles out the one thing, the thing that he knows the best, the five books of Moses. And he says, well, how do you read it? You tell me. Somebody else in John chapter three, you remember Nick at night, Nicodemus shows up at night to see Jesus and he asks him, or actually tells him, he begins with this great compliment, or what he thinks is a compliment. He says, we know that you're a prophet that's come from God because nobody could do the things that you're doing unless he did come from God. And then Jesus hits him right between the eyes with a statement that he wasn't ready for. And Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He tells Nicodemus, hey, Nick, you need to be born again. And he goes, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he go into his mother's womb a second time? He didn't really think that through, probably saying it. <laughs> but, and Jesus said, listen, you know, flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. Don't be amazed that I tell you you must be born again. And he tells Nicodemus, who's this premier teacher in all of Israel, you, Nicodemus, need a new birth because you're a walking dead man. Three different answers to three different people of how to get to heaven. One is keep all the commandments. One is love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And the other one says you need to be born again. Because Jesus speaks to you where you are, and he will target the thing that you need. And I believe he'll do that for every one of you this morning. Amen. And so Jesus... Answering his question with a question, you know, that's always a good thing, isn't it? Somebody asks you a question, you ask them a question. You ever play a game, you might want to try just having a conversation just with questions. It's fun. What do you mean? Don't you think I know what I mean? He said to him, what is written in the law and what is your reading of it? Well, he's, he's a master of the law, right? He's a self-proclaimed expert. And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He pulled out two scriptures. One was Deuteronomy chapter 6, and the other one was Leviticus chapter 19. Good job, dude. You, you know what you're talking about. Notice they're only in the first five books. Love God and love others. And love isn't a squishy feeling or where we would fail this morning even. It's not a squishy feeling. It's a commitment. It's a commitment to sacrifice of self for God and others. That's what it is. Because love is patient. Love is kind. You guys know the list. That's what love is. And it's interesting that he knew the right answer. And if you look back in Mark, when Jesus was being questioned, this is what was said to him one time. Then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? That's a different question. What's the most important thing that you can sum up in the scriptures? And Jesus said, the first of the commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's called the Shema, by the way. Shema means hearing, which it begins with hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So Jesus is teaching and saying these things, and suddenly he asks one of the teachers of the law, when the guy tries 
sticking it to him. And he goes, well, what do you think it is? And he just basically mimics back what he's already heard Jesus say. And that's why Jesus says, bingo, you got it, man. Go and do that. He says to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. How many of you can do this? Me neither. How many of you have been successful at doing this this morning? Unlike what you know, there are two ways to God. Oh, I'm going to get fired. One way is to live a perfect life, and God will let you into heaven, and you won't ruin the neighborhood. But that's impossible. The other is to receive forgiveness by the sacrifice of his only son for your sin and accept him as your Lord, which means boss and savior, which means deliverer. So you got two ways and Jesus is telling you, yeah, you could go this way. You do that and you'll live, you'll make it. You'll live forever. If you do that, if it is a present and perfect situation from now until the end, until you die. And if you have been flawless up to this point, you're in good shape. Nobody does that. Do you see the point? It's dripping with sarcasm. Sarcasm's mean. No one should be sarcastic. Except for the Bible. (laughs) Micah 6, verses 6 to 8 in the Old Testament. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, tens, thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? You see, the prophet is crying out, what can I do to be made right with God? Can I even sacrifice my own son? It's interesting because that's what God does. Verse 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly? That means always do the right thing. To love mercy, that means to show mercy in everything that you do. And to walk humbly with your God. Never to say anything in pride. Eh, You guys all got that, right? This is... (laughs) Do you see, the problem is none of us can do this. And that's what Jesus is trying to convince this guy of. He says, what must I do? And Jesus says, live a perfect life. Because that's how you get to spend time with a perfect, holy God. And yet none of us has the stuff to be able to do it because we're all broken. Amen? Amen. That's what I say. That's what Bruce Willis says. It's what that girl says. It's what Mr. Bean says. It's what President Trump said. It ain't happening. It's not happening. This guy came up to Jesus trying to test him and trip him up, thinking he was all that in a bag of chips, trying to confound him with a question. And Jesus turned it around and asked him a question. And then when he answered, he thought he was, hey, look what I did. And Jesus says, yep. You got it. Head of the class, A plus. Now go do that, which means and implies you haven't been doing it. Start today. And if you want to take Jesus up on that offer. And then he begins the second section and wanting to justify himself. Why did he want to justify himself? Because Jesus told him something he can't do, but he knows he should, and he can't, and no one can. What do I do about that? Uh, 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 I better look for a loophole, quick. (laughs) But wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? You know, I don't want to waste any of this love on somebody that's not really my neighbor that I'm not supposed to be loving. I want to know who my neighbor is so I can show just the right amount of love to just the right people. Do you understand the motive behind all this? I don't want to love too much because I'm just so full of love for everybody. I'm thinking of everyone above myself. 
you see how prideful he is? He's looking for a loophole. There's got to be a loophole. If you, if you look through contracts, you're looking for loopholes. And that's what he's doing. I love, I love this guy right here. I love his face. <laughs> hmm? Who's my neighbor, Jesus? Because they believe in self-justification. You see, if I'm good, I go to heaven. And if I'm bad, I go to hell. Or maybe nobody goes to hell because there are people preaching that. So I'd like to buy that. I'd like hell for 100, please, Alex. Uh, yeah, nobody goes. That's great. I'd love that. But that's, Jesus talked more about hell than he did heaven. So that's not the case. And if that's not the case, then there's no punishment for evil. So why would you not want to do whatever the heck it is you want to do? So in Luke 16, verses 13 to 15, Jesus says this, no servant can serve two masters for you'll hate one and love the other or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon was the God of riches, if you will. So it's a demon essentially. Now the Pharisees were lovers of money also heard these things and they derided him. In other words, they gave him a hard time. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. We are always trying to be right. Not you good people, but most people want to be right. And I will fight you to the death to prove I'm right. Because for me to admit I'm wrong when I'm not wrong is just wrong. <laughs> and for me to admit I'm wrong even when I am wrong, that just feels wrong. <laughs> See, that's the sinful nature of human beings. That's not loving God with your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind. It's not loving your neighbors yourself. It's loving you and you and you and you and you. And, you know, tough, tough on you, man. Like you're going to have to deal with your own life. Self-justification. We call it rationalization in the psychological realm. Luke 18 verses 9 to 14 reads this way. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One, a Pharisee. The other, a tax collector. Even back then, the IRS was not favored. <laughs> the Pharisee stood and prayed this, thus to himself. He's praying with himself. Notice he's not talking to God. It's an exhibition. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Jesus says in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus says, if you think you're going to make it on your own merits, you can't. That's the point he's trying to convince this lawyer of. And now he's going to bring a story to reinforce that point. It's not, hey, just be nice. It's you can't be this nice. Which is the good and the bad news of it. So who's my neighbor? I love loopholes. <laughs> Jesus is going to trip up, supposedly, and not know what a neighbor is. He's going to find a loophole, which is an escape, an excuse, a plea, an avoidance, an evasion, a pretense, a pretext, a subterfuge, or a means of escape. Because he wants to justify himself. Jesus told him, hey, you got it, man. You make sure you go and do that. And he suddenly felt conviction because he doesn't do that. And so he has an urge. I have an urge to find a loophole because I'm in deep duty. I am guilty of sin before a holy God. And I just realized that. 
I was trying to be all smug and smart with Jesus and he caught me with my pants down. Now what I need to do is find an excuse. Well, why did you do it? Well, I'm Italian. All, all Italians are drunks. And so that's what I did. You know, I'm Irish. So all Ita Irish are drunks. You know, I, I, well, why'd you get drunk? Well, because I'm, you know, fill in the blank, just put something in there and it's an excuse. It's a loophole. It's a reason why you can't control yourself and you're not accountable for your actions. Well, I, you know, I didn't eat today. This whole sleep thing with putting an hour back. I mean, what, I'm all twisted up about it. It's an excuse. It's a loophole and it doesn't hold up. It doesn't hold water. It doesn't float. It doesn't work. So who's my neighbor? Mr. Rogers is my neighbor. I just, I, won't you be my neighbor? It just plays in my head. Then Jesus answered and said, answering this guy who says, who's my neighbor? This is, the, this is his answer, who your neighbor is. And Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. This guy's a victim. It wasn't his fault. He's on the road going somewhere. He's doing something. He's got business. He gets jumped by thieves. And by the way, this road is notorious for that. It's a 17 mile stretch of road from Jericho to Jerusalem. It's called the way of blood. They even have a pass there called blood pass because people got beaten, killed, murdered, and left there dead all the time. It's this treacherous bit of highway. There was a man don't no knowing where he's from. And especially when they strip him down naked, nobody knows who he is, where he comes from. Sometimes you can tell by clothing, whether somebody's a professional or not a professional, somebody's a laborer, somebody's from another country. You can tell things by the way that people dress. He's got no clothes. There's no way of knowing anything. And he's left there for dead. He's telling this highly sophisticated, theological, law-minded professional, a tragic story, which probably has no resemblance to anything in this guy's real life. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. You know what that's like. That's like screening your phone calls, right? I don't know who that is. Now, I know you do it because I've called you and you haven't answered. I know that. <laughs> a priest, a guy who's tight with God, a guy who performs religious ceremonies, a guy who's dedicated his life to serving God. And you would think he loves God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength and all of his mind. And he loves his neighbor as himself because those are the two greatest laws. You would assume this guy knows what to do. And he walks by on the other side. Well, the more, the more people you read, the more confused you can get. Maybe he didn't want to defile himself because then he wouldn't be able to serve in the temple. Maybe he didn't want to get involved. Maybe he was worried he, his own safety because maybe, maybe they're still around. Maybe, 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 maybe. Loopholes. For whatever reason, he walks by. He sees this man in need and walks by. Who's first? He is. Which means God isn't. And then, likewise, a Levite from the tribe of Levi. These were the folks that would help in the temple. They would be uh, the ones that would assist the priests. A Levite arrived at that place, came and looked, and passed by on the other side. Okay, so maybe he's not a priest. Maybe he doesn't have all these duties and things to do and places to go and people to see and, you know... But here's a Levite who knows. And he does the same thing. He sees and he continues on. And it's almost like a joke. Three guys went into a bar. There was a priest. There was a Levite. There was a Jew. The priest walks up to the bar. It's almost like one of those jokes. And so you're assuming that the third person is going to be a Jew, at least to the Jewish mind and to this lawyer who's listening to Jesus's parable except he doesn't do that. By the way, this is what the road looks like. 
This is the actual road and 17 miles worth of dirt and dust. Nothing grows. There's, there's no gas stations. There's no uh, Wawa for coffee. There's nothing. And that's why thieves used to hide out and rob people on this thing. It was a vital thoroughfare. But a certain Samaritan. Now, Samaritan is almost like a curse word in this nation. Samaritans were people that lived in Samaria. Samaria was overtaken around 700 BC and the Babylonians came in, took these, or the Assyrians came in, took the people away and planted their own people in there and they all intermingled. And so they weren't purely Jewish anymore. And so they were kind of mixed. And in the Jewish mind, that was a terrible thing. And so a Samaritan, a questionable background. This isn't a Jew. This is, this is a Samaritan. That's what makes the story so like a punch in the face to this guy. And so he journeyed and he came to where he was. When he saw him, he had compassion. The other guys had no compassion. He had compassion. Now, usually this is the Sunday school version of what we go away with. We should have compassion on whether Johnny, you should not smack that little girl in the head. You know, you shouldn't, you should be kind like the good Samaritan. And we always use the good Samaritan, right? In fact, we call this the good Samaritan, but you know, Jesus never calls him the good Samaritan. We call him that. And so he shows compassion and he went to him and he bandaged his wounds Pouring on oil and wine, by the way, the wine was an antiseptic. It would actually clean out the wound, uh, wound and he would close it up with the bandages and the oil would coat the outside. It would actually begin the healing process. It would also put a layer over the top so bacteria wouldn't get inside this nice fresh wound. And so oil and wine, there's, there's other meanings behind that, but oil and wine essentially is first aid kit. Get him cleaned up and get him wrapped up and sent him on his own animal. So now the guy's walking. Brought him to an inn. Now, it, it wasn't like the Red Roof Inn or the Holiday Inn. It was somebody that had a big enough house. They wanted to make some extra cash and you could stay with them. And took care of him. This is pretty magnanimous. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you do this perpetually. But you know, it probably took him all day and he gets there at night and he spends the night with this guy and takes care of him. A total stranger. He doesn't know who this guy is. He doesn't know if maybe he was a criminal and he got beat up because the other guys, you know, he doesn't know the situation. You don't know who you have welcoming in, into your house here. But he spends the night with him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii. Now, you, you guys have denarii on you, right? You don't know what that is. Two denarii is two days' wage. A denarii is what you would get paid for a day's wage. So whatever it is that you would think you would make in a day, he gives him two of those. That's a pretty hefty fee to stay overnight. He gives him two denarii. And by the way, if you had one denarii, you could stay at a place for a month. They actually found a sign near Jerusalem that actually lists the prices and it was one thirty-second of a denarii is, is what the cost would be for you to stay at the inn. So you could stay there for two months with two denarii, just to give you an idea of how lavish this guy's gift is. He gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. And that's the end of the story. Now, I don't know about you, but giving money to a total stranger to take care of another total stranger and giving them two months worth of coverage for an inn. You know, I do, I've done some nice things. I'm a good person. I, I've never done anything that nice. You get the idea that this is a perfect person to the nth degree. That's why Jesus tells the story this way. And then he says, of which of these three do you think was a neighbor? Amen. See, this guy says, hey, who's my neighbor? And he says, well, who are you a neighbor to? That's the question. Who are you a neighbor to? Who have you made your neighbor? Most people would say, I don't even talk to the person who lives next to me. 
who showed, he says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. You see, this guy couldn't even say the Samaritan. He couldn't even say that word because it was like a curse word. I guess the guy in the story that did good things for him wouldn't even mention him by name. Do you, you see the, the underpinnings of hate there where he won't even mention it was the Samaritan who's the good guy in the story. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Make sure that from now on, that's what you do to everyone that you meet. That's the story of the Good Samaritan. It's an impossible hurdle for any human being to ever attain to. And yet, in a legalistic mindset, we think, well, Jesus is telling a parable to show how we should behave. That's what it is to love somebody like yourself, because if it was you that fell, if it was you that got robbed, if it was you that was left for dead and some total stranger showed up, cleaned all your wounds, bound you up, put, put you on their mount, walked to the nearest inn, which could have been who knows how far, and then took two days worth of pay out of your pocket to take care of this guy to a total stranger who will probably rip you off anyway. Who does that? I've done some good things, but I've never done anything like that. And the whole point that Jesus is making to this lawyer is, yep, that's your neighbor. Everyone. Everyone with a need. Every one of you guys is my neighbor. And I'm your neighbor. I got some needs. I'm ready to tell you about them in a minute. <laughs> Jesus is setting up this impossible obstacle course that no one can master. And he says, that's how you get to heaven. That's how you inherit eternal life, dude. And this is the kind of love that you need to show for your neighbor. Not please and thank you, let me open a door for you. That's silliness. There's no sacrifice in that. So Jesus said, that's what you do. Captain Kirk smirks. It reminds me of this story about everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. You probably have heard it before. There was a team that had four members called everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everyone was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it. Nobody realized that every, it was everybody's job. Everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. <laughs> I wanted to memorize it, but I'm not that smart. <laughs> you see, that's not loving God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength and all of your mind. And loving your neighbor as yourself is an impossibility. If that is a requirement to inherit eternal life, no one makes it. That's the message. That's what Jesus is teaching in the Good Samaritan, not we should be kinder. That's kind of flattening and squashing it into a dot. It's not what Jesus was saying. Now what happened is they went, they entered a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. By the way, it was her house, her brother's house, and her sister's house. But she's a type A personality. It's my house. Welcome to my house. People walk in here this morning, and I feel like I'm welcoming people to my house. Welcome to my house. Are you the pastor? Well, yes, I am. Welcome to my house. If I wasn't a pastor, you know what? This would be my house. Because I take everything. Sorry. So Martha welcomed him into her house and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus's feet and heard his word. By the way, she's mentioned of three times in scripture and every time she's at the feet of Jesus. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, 
Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. I'm sure it was in that tone. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. <coughs> this parable of the Good Samaritan is just before they get there to Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha are the opposite of what happened with the Samaritan. The Samaritan, there were people that went on the other side and didn't do anything. And the guy who did all the work was the, was the hero of the, the story. Now we get to this room, this house, and there's one person doing all the work. Who's Martha? Who's the good guy in the story? Who's the good girl in the story? Mary is. Jesus said so. Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his word. By what Jesus says, that's a better place to be. That's a better place to be than to be up running around like a maniac, looking with judgment on everybody because you're doing all the work. You see, one does the work for the right reason, and one's doing the work for the wrong reason. Martha's doing it because she's all tied up with stuff. Oh my goodness, people are in my house. It's a reflection on me. I better vacuum before Jesus and the disciples show up. If Jesus was going to show up with his disciples, I know you'd clean the house, right? There's some stuff that you'd say, oh my goodness, my underwear's on the floor. I got to clean that up. I know, I know you'd clean up. I mean, I'm going to select one of you lucky people. I'm going to come to your house right after church. We're going to see how everything looks. Just me. But you see, she feels the burden of doing as opposed to hearing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mary chose to love God first. Should we be doing work? Well, the story of the Good Samaritan says we should be doing work. We should be doing outstanding work but not when it's done with a rotten attitude. Not when you're looking down at everybody else saying, hey, nobody works like me. I wish all y'all would work like me. That's like the lawyer. In our hearts and minds, we need to go from being lawyers to being neighbors. Just who is my neighbor? I need to make sure I don't waste any of this good love on someone I don't have to love. We need to go from workers, which is what Martha was, to worshipers, which is what Mary was. Mary chose the better part, and it won't be taken away from her, Jesus said. Getting our priorities straight, making sure that we love God with all that we have and loving our neighbors is important. But when loving your neighbors, make sure you don't do it to show off. Make sure you don't do it with a crummy heart. Make sure you don't do it to be seen of men, which the Pharisees did. Make sure that you don't forget for whom you serve. You know, work, any work should be worship. Work is worship. I don't care what you're doing. You're collecting tolls on the, on the turnpike. Hey, God bless you. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Hey, God bless you. You pray for those people. You, you can do ministry right there in a toll booth, which I think would be like insane for me. I'd want to talk to everybody. When you know that you're doing your work, not for a boss whose eye is on you, who's going to, you know, give you a write up. Or, it's none of that. You work for the Lord 100% of the time. And you will never work a day in your life. Amen. You'll wake up early. You'll stay late. You'll, you'll be able to, to withstand anything if you know that you're doing this for the Lord God Almighty who sees in secret. And you'll never work a day in your life. That's a secret. We just have to make sure that our heart is in the right place. 
Spend some time at the feet of Jesus, like Mary. Seek to love the Lord with everything you have, and don't forget to love your neighbor in a way like the Good Samaritan does. We're never going to earn our way to get to heaven by doing any of those things. We do those things because we've already been given the way to heaven. The scripture teaches us in Romans 3, 21 to 26, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation or a provision by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins who were previously committed to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the long run on sentence from Romans, which means you can't make yourself right before God. God came, died for you, so that by you accepting him into your life as your boss and as your redeemer, your savior, you get his righteousness. He takes away your sin. And now you can do those things freely from a right heart. Not because you're trying to perform, be good enough. There's no good enough. No one's good enough. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We need a savior. Jesus came to do that. He was the only one who could do it. If you don't know him as your savior, you can ask him today very simply by confessing I'm broken and I can't do these things. I need you to come into my life and be my boss. I quit. Amen. I've screwed in my life enough. I'm giving it over to you. Do what you can. It sounds very simplistic, but I made that prayer and God made a change in my life. And it wasn't something that I worked up to. It's not something I've earned and it's not something I'll ever be worthy of. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've done this, I want you to say amen. amen. It makes all the difference in our lives, guys. Mm -hmm.